Hello everyone, how are you? It's Dr. Splickle. We are going to be doing a case study today and that case study is all about foot fusions. What do you do if you have a client or patient who has had a surgical fusion? So I had a patient this week who had a talonavicular and a calcaneal cuboid fusion. Their midfoot is fused. What do you do? They came to me because they were concerned and had wanted to increase their subtalar joint and their ankle joint mobility, despite the fact that their midfoot was fused. So I'm going to show you the patient's x-rays, and then we're going to have a little bit of conversation of what you can expect in a patient like this. I find that it is a very good learning opportunity. So if I flip my camera over, so you can see this patient's x-rays. So this is looking at the rear foot and they have their talonavicular and calcaneal cuboid joint fused. Now the reason why they had this fusion, if I look, this will be just the lateral x-ray of this patient, is they had the fusion because they had a congenital talar deformity. So the alignment of the talus just at birth, how they were positioned in utero was in a oblique or uh, sometimes they're called a vertical talar position. And what that does is that causes a lot of stress on the foot that he ended up having a fusion at uh, 16 years old. So my concern right away seeing a foot like that is I want to see the way that the other foot looks. So this is a comparison of the two lateral x-rays. So this is his other foot. And then this is going to be the left foot. Now, when we look at these, what I want you to also appreciate from this position here is if we look at right foot to left foot, do you see that limb length difference that was created by the foot structure on the right. So right away when we're seeing this patient or this client, I want you to be thinking in your head, how are we going to manage the limb length discrepancy? Second thing that we're going to be speaking about is how do I manage the fact that his midfoot is fused, but his rear foot is not fused? So let's continue that conversation. Now, what's really important to understand is that our talus articulates not just with the calcaneus below, which is the subtalar joint, but it also articulates with the tibia above and the navicular in front. So it's articulating with three different joints makes your talus very special, but it also means that if you are going to fuse one of those connections, you essentially locked up the other connections. Let me show you that on the x-ray so that you can appreciate that because I really want you to understand that. So if we look at the x-ray, right? So we're fusing the talonavicular relationship, but the calcaneal cuboid relationship is still open and the talar tibial relationship is still open. So talar calcaneus, subtalar joint, and tibia talus, ankle joint, are still not fused, but the talonavicular component is. Now, every time you move the ankle joint, you essentially move the subtalar joint. And every time you move the subtalar joint, you essentially move the talonavicular joint. So what I had to explain to this patient is, one, that surgeon really should have fused that subtalar joint. If you are not fusing both aspects or two aspects of that talus and the joints that it articulates with, you create transfer stress. So this patient was definitely presenting with pain in the subtalar joint or the area of the subtalar joint called the sinus tarsi. This is the joint that is sitting between the talus and the calcaneus. That's called the, the sinus tarsi. So he was complaining about pain sinus tarsi. Now he came to me saying, I want to increase my foot mobility so I can optimize my function. So he was doing a lot of subtalar joint movement. He was trying to drive inversion and eversion out of his foot. And I told him straight away, one of your recommendations from me is to stop doing that. Do not do that because your talonavicular joint is fused. You cannot move 
one joint when half of the other aspect of that bone is fused. That causes transfer stress. Second thing that we focused on was his ankle and the limited ankle mobility. Your talus, every time you move your ankle, has to have some fluidity in its position. Again, part of that talus is fused. So the gliding and this kind of giving away or softness or symphony of the, the talus in relation to the ankle is not possible and has been taken away because of this fusion. So I told him that, yes, you can do ankle mobility from a soft tissue perspective and making sure that the calves and the Achilles tendon and the plantar foot are mobile, but you have to have a realistic expectation of how much ankle mobility you're actually going to get. He had very, very little plantar flexion. So what he was doing is sitting on his feet and trying to sit on his feet, right? To try it, if you're, almost if you're doing child pose, to try to increase plantar flexion of the ankle. And I said, your second recommendation for me is to stop doing that. Do not do that because you are going to potentially put excess compression and force on the nerves on the top of the foot. And I do not want you to get nerve irritation. I've had some patients that sat on their feet, just like child pose for a very long period and actually irritated the nerve and got foot drop. It was a temporary foot drop, but they got foot drop. So please be careful with that. So patient first, again, just summarizing, stop doing STJ mobility work. It's not going to happen because your T and J is fused. Stop doing heavy, heavy ankle plantar flexion or dorsiflexion in an aggressive way. Yes, we can do soft tissue work. Yes, we could try to do some distractions and open up the joint and do tailor positioning with a monster band. Sure, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. But let's be realistic about that expectation. Third is that he's in orthotics. Now he was wanting my opinion on, do I need to be in orthotics or should I not? When the TNJ is fused and the STJ or the subtalar joint is not fused, and it technically should be, is he could either go in and have another surgery to fuse the subtalar joint, or we do need to be in something that kind of locks down the subtalar joint because I don't want him to get transfer stress. He's potentially setting himself up for arthritis in that subtalar joint. So I told him, if you don't want to be in orthotics, I understand. How do I work with you to make this your reality? So what I did is I taught him how to build up his minimal shoes with different paddings to essentially mimic the orthotic, but get him into this more minimal environment, which is what he's wanting. So where, where can we find, where can we agree on that middle ground? So I told him to get a scaphoid pad. This is a pad, kind of like a moon shaped pad that goes on the medial arch of the shoe. And then I also told him to get a varus post. So just a little bit of a post in his heel to give a little bit of correction to the back of the foot and kind of lock it, lock it in a quoting way. And then let's talk about that limb length discrepancy. So he has a limb length discrepancy because of this uh, position of his subtalar of his talus and the way that it was fused. So his discrepancy is probably around almost an inch. Um, and again, this I'm seeing him virtually. So the exact number of that discrepancy, I do not have, I would have to send him for a scanogram, which is a way that you can get an accurate, uh, quantified limb length discrepancy but he has one. You guys saw it in the pictures, right? So he needs a heel lift. I'm sorry. He needs a heel lift. This, there is no conversation. Is this functional versus structural limb length discrepancy? This is a great example of structural limb length discrepancy because of this genetic or congenital alignment and fusion. So that's called a one inch limb length discrepancy. So we're going to put in approximately a half an inch lift into his shoe. Now I told him there is a way that you can train barefoot. I can find a way for everyone to train barefoot. What he's going to be doing, his next recommendation to improve his connection to his foot, knowing that it was surgically, knowing that his foot was surgically fused in two of the joints is going to be uh, 
to bring in that sensory stimulation through Naboso. So he's training on a Naboso mat. And what he's going to do is he's going to lay out the Naboso training mat. And on the side that his right foot is going to go, he's going to build it up half an inch. So that half an inch, he's just going to put something under it, another another mat he could find and kind of make like a wood piece that would go under it so it's still hard, which would be great. And then his right foot's going to be on the Naboso mat. And then to mimic some of this orthotic to kind of just give a little bit of extra support to the foot, uh, just again, because it's fused, we want to continue to try to lock that subtalar joint is he is getting a 10 degree wedge that's going to go under the inside medial heel. So if you could picture him, he's on a Naboso mat. His right foot is built up half an inch to take away some of that limb length discrepancy. And then to control the pronation in that subtalar joint, he's going to put a wedge under the medial side of his right heel. He could also put the scaphoid pad directly on his foot when he is training barefoot. And then he'd still get the cutaneous or the skin stimulation of all other aspects of the foot. So this is something that I think is really important to understand because his understanding was even though two joints in my foot are fused, I can still focus on my subtalar joint and my ankle joint. But that's actually not the case. So my big takeaways on this case study are the T and J or the talonavicular joint moves every time you move your subtalar joint. It moves every time you move your ankle. So if you are fusing half of that joint or a third of that joint and then trying to move the other aspects of it, it's not possible, right? So we don't want to ever create transfer stress. The ankle is a little bit, has a little bit more freedom of movement than the subtalar joint, but for sure, hands down to everyone who's listening, if that talonavicular joint is fused, that subtalar joint technically should be fused. What I learned in my surgical training is that you never fuse the TNJ without fusing the STJ. And that is really what, if you've ever heard of a triple arthrodesis, a triple arthrodesis is kind of what he had, but he didn't have the rest of the fusion. Only two of the joints were fused. So a triple arthrodesis is a TNJ, STJ, ST, uh, CCJ fusion. And that is for severe overpronation that is just completely arthritic. Okay, so I hope this helped everybody. I hope that it was interesting. It was definitely an interesting presentation for myself. I hope that you learned. If you have any questions, do please reach out. If you want to learn more about high approach patients, please follow me on Instagram or check out my website, dremilysplickle.com. That is dremilysplickle.com. Stay barefoot strong.